Hey there, this is Seth Juarez. We're coming to you live from the Moscone Center in San Francisco, California. This is Build 2016 Edition, and I'm here with the great Mark Rusinovich. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good. Good to see you again, Seth. The CTO of Azure. Man, when they gave you that, did they give you like a really huge badge that lets you into any sort of facility that we have? I mean, this is pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So tell us, what do you work on? What's your favorite part of the job? We're just going to spend some time with Mark. All right. Uh, so as CTO, I'm responsible for technical strategy and architecture of the Azure core platform. Mm -hmm. So this includes platform as a service, all the way down to the way that our servers and data centers are designed, to hypervisor and virtual machines. Awesome. So again, if you're watching, please tune in with some questions. We're going to look at them over here. And I'm going to be looking sometimes over there at the questions. But right. again, we're it's still It's just not that I'm boring you. Yeah, no, so. you're not boring me. So yeah. please ask your questions. We have the CTO of Azure to answer any question, like how to do your hair so wonderfully, or how to have a wonderful smile. You get Jeffrey Snover to do it for you. Oh, that's right, Jeffrey Snover. Yeah. By the way, he's tomorrow at 8. Yeah. All right, we're so we can. We're so, so I need to be careful because he has the last word. That's <laughs> uh -oh, what I'm hearing. Uh oh, I won't tell yeah. him that though. I'll <laughs> tell him you're after. Yeah. So let's start first with some of the new stuff that we saw today in the keynote that you were excited about that we announced for yeah. for this. Well, week. so working on the core part of the platform, I had a very, I've had a very direct involvement in Service Fabric and bringing that out to market. So it was very exciting. I think a landmark day when it comes to the evolution of the cloud, cloud native computing, and and a cloud native platform that it really I think is. Uh, much more advanced than anything that's out there in terms of its cap life cycle capabilities, the stateful compute capabilities, the maturity, the fact that we've built so many services in Azure and on top of Azure across the company on top of it, so it's got incredible mileage underneath it. Literally tens of millions of hours of compute are under under its wheels at this point, so and we're making that available for developers to take advantage of. And that's amazing, and I feel like the demo that Scott Hanselman did with that game was sort of illustrative of what Service Fabric can do, but he kind of went really fast, so let's, let's sort yeah. of dive into what was actually happening and why it was so amazing, what was happening. Yeah, well, so one of, you know, Service Fabric being a microservices platform, you define your application as a set of microservices, and then you can update each microservice independently, and you can do it in a, a way that has causes no downtime. Right. I think so. That's one aspect of it, uh, and what uh, Scott sh uh, showed was the the fact that he rolled out a bad upgrade. He right. had custom health monitors watching the application, so it has both built-in health monitors as well as the custom ones. When it saw something going wrong, it automatically rolled back to the previous version. But I think one of the most the key differentiators of Service Fabric, and one that this game highlighted, is the fact that it supports stateful microservices, where you store the state directly on the servers for the, the highest throughput, the lowest latency, the maximum scalability, and that's what helps them power up to supporting 50,000 concurrent users, is, is the fact uh, that instead of reaching out to some remote store, you're able, it's able to store the data completely locally. And we did a couple of videos on this earlier that are on Channel Line, one that came out this morning on, That's right. on Azure mm -hmm. Service Fabric. But I think the cool thing, and you didn't mention this, was that the game didn't stop. Yeah. Even when there was badness, right? And that's that to me is impressive, but it feels a little magical to me. Can you, as a CTO, tell us what actually was going on under the hood that made it so that this game could continue even though there was badness? Yeah, well, so that's, Part of the microservices decomposition is that each microservice lives independently and is interacting with the other ones independently. On top of that, each one is, consists of multiple replica or instances. So this is all about scaling out. Sure. And you scale out for two reasons, one for scale itself and the other one for availability. Once you have this scaled out microservice, if one instance goes bad, you still have a lot of other ones that are sitting there picking up the load. Right. So when you're rolling out an update, you do it replica by replica in some percentage rolling upgrade manner. You're watching each step as you roll it out. The first time, signal you get that something's bad, you immediately stop and roll back, and so you get back to full capacity. So you know, the bad updates are reducing capacity of the healthy instances, but if you don't completely take down all your healthy instances, you're still able to, to serve some of the traffic, and so that's kind of what you saw is the combination of those two things, the independence of the the microservice that was mm -hmm. hosting the ship with the zero health as well yeah. as everything else was continuing to operate independently of that. And the fact that the, the health monitoring caught the rollout before it completely took everything down. And that, that's amazing because I, I saw, that's the first time I had ever seen that UI 
it's literally like you're driving a spaceship with thousands, you could potentially be thousands of, yeah. of sort of container, or not containers, but microservices that are doing all this stuff and you can see the health of each one of them. Tell me a little bit more about how that UI works. And I'm trying to visualize it again. How did you guys come up with this stuff? Well, we came up with, came up with this really out of necessity. Uh, so one of the things we realized early on is if we wanted to create our own services and have them support this kind of agility with the, the fact that we needed to support stateful microservices, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second, okay. the first service that we built on top of Service Fabric that kind of co-evolved with it was Azure Database. Right. So we, this is almost 10 years ago, we started embarked on this journey. We wanted to build database as a service. The buck stops with the stateful service. It's not like Azure Database can say, you know what, I'm going to be stateless and hand this off to somebody else. It needed to store the state and it needed to make it highly durable. At the same time, we needed to be able to offer the cloud promise of it's on 24 by 7 and when we roll out upgrades, we need to make sure that we catch failures before they bring down the whole database. And so that's really led to us developing the Service Fabric application. And so it was, a, it was a necessity thing. It's like, hey, we are promising customers that this Azure database is always going to work. There might be problems with some VMs that are running it. We need to find a way to solve exactly. this issue. Exactly. And so what were some things that you learned along the way? Because distributed computing is not for the faint of heart. Yeah. Right, so what were some things that you learned along the way that informed the decisions you made that went into Azure? Uh... Yeah, well, so one of the things, you know, a lot of people talk about, when they talk about state, leadership election was a key part of managing state in the primaries of the database. You know, because each Azure database is represented by three or four microservice instances. Right. Each one is actually its own application. So that means we can upgrade somebody's database directly without right. impact upgrading everybody else's, so we get some isolation there. But one of the things we learned is that Paxos didn't give us the scale. And you know, most you know, projects out there that are talking about state or leadership election are built on top of Paxos. We've got a, a, our own algorithms that we've developed over the last 15 years that manage that state and keeping track of the primaries and the secondaries and what's caught up with, with uh, the other things. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the the learnings, we had to evolve the algorithms to get to this kind of scale. So literally, Service Fabric is able to operate across tens of thousands of VMs or servers with hundreds of thousands up into the order of millions of microservice instances deployed across it. Something very hard to do with Paxos. And so we've got this distributed ring architecture underneath it. On top of the algorithm work, though, one of the things that we've had to hone over time is all the timeouts, all the retries, all right. of the implementation details of getting it right, getting the algorithms coded right, and getting it to really work in a production environment in a seamless way. So I'd say lots of learnings about how to develop a system that operates at that kind of scale with this kind of smoothness. Azure database is operating at those kinds of scales, and they're deploying upgrades to, to databases dozens of times a day. And they've been doing this for years now, very reliably on top of Service Fabric. And that's awesome because it's not like, hey, let's release this thing and let's hope it takes. It's more of, hey, we've learned these things over a decade yeah. that are going to be helpful to you and your organization. Exactly. And that's, I think, one of the cool things that makes me proud uh, is to be able to take a technology like that that we've created internally, it's powering so much of our cloud, and give it directly to developers. It's not like, oh, we'll make a version of this, we'll give it to you, it's the lightweight version, yeah. you know, the the easy version, it is the, the actual bits that we run. Developers can build their own applications like you see Age of Ascent built right on top of the same bits that are powering Azure Database and Cortana and Intune and Azure VMs. And that was awesome because I, I remember, I think in the video the developers like, and then it spins up, I don't know, I don't care yeah. how many machines, right. it's the cloud, right? Who cares? I mean, you could not say that maybe five, 10 years ago, because when you say, I don't care how many computers, that meant you had millions of extra dollars laying around just to have somebody come, and Sue was going to put it in, and then, and then Jane, the IT person, was going to come make sure yeah. it's all Give wired. it a name, yeah. keep track of it, is it patched, you know, all of the things you got to do when you're managing infrastructure. Uh, these platform like Service Fabric, and Service Fa Azure Service Fabric, where it's, we manage the cluster for you, right. takes care of all of that for you. And so it's amazing for a, a developer to just flippantly say, I don't care. Yeah. And, and that's amazing. So let's move on to the second thing when it comes to Azure Service Fabric that I think is hard 
and that maybe we need to address. How do you know if, if a node is healthy or not? Right, because a, a health concern yeah. in an application, because let's just say you're running a VM, there's probably multiple microservices running in there. How do you know if it's healthy? And then once you know that it's unhealthy, how do you fix that in sort of a distributed way? That's a great question. So there's a few things that are going on. Service Driver has this ring topology I mentioned, mm -hmm. and it's using what are called leases for these nodes to talk to each other with a distributed view of health. So this is part of the distributed algorithms is Service Fabric, it's a distributed brain, so it's different than some of the other cluster orchestrators that have their brain separate from the actual sure. infrastructure. Service Fabric runs on all the nodes, keeps track of the state of all the nodes, and part of it is, can I talk to the guys around me? How, is, it, is that node reachable from around the ring? And based on the leases, we'll determine, is something wrong with the VM? So that's kind of the infrastructure health layer. And then you see the application layer of health, which is what the, the demo today yeah. showed, which is they wrote custom health, what we call them watchdogs, to look and determine if the application is health, healthy. And so you really need a combination of the two. Is the infrastructure healthy? Is the application healthy? You're going to take different actions depending on what's unhealthy. Infrastructure healthy, of course, the application on top of that's going to be unhealthy, and then you go and heal yeah. the infrastructure. If the application's unhealthy, you heal the application, which might be if you're doing a rollout to roll back. And that's one of the things that Service Fabric has is built-in infrastructure health monitoring, default application health monitoring, and then you can augment it with your own insights about, you know what, if the ship is you know, exploding, that's unhealthy. You yeah. know, if, you know, with zero health, that's an unhealthy thing. And that's a very custom type of health. And that's interesting because I don't think in our previous video we talked about watchdogs. Can you talk a little bit more about watchdog, what watchdogs are and if you're building this type of huge application that's supposed to be distributed, yeah. what kind of watchdogs would you typically write? So watchdogs are really something that you write that makes health statements to Service Fabric about microservice instances. I see. And so you, the statements are really, it's unhealthy or it's he healthy what the logic that goes into that is totally up to you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, like the examples that I gave you, ship you know, blowing up, yeah. uh, that might be unhealthy. Uh, something else that might be unhealthy is CPU utilization of this microservice goes above a certain threshold. So it's really uh, everything from kind of infrastructure level resource utilization to custom logic that is it's kind of the business logic of the application that defines whether it's operating health, healthy or not. It can be even synthetic probes of the a application to see if it's responding appropriately and then making statements to Service Fabric about the health saying, you know, where I'm doing an upgrade, I'm, my watchdog is going to go perform synthetic, synthetic operations. If they fail, I'm going to make an unhealthy health report to Service Fabric. And then I've got these policies in the upgrade. You can say, by default, if it's going unhealthy, roll it back, and so that's just going to automatically trigger. And that's, that's amazing, right? Because what you're telling me, if I'm understanding correctly, is at the infrastructure layer, there's stuff that we're just going to do yeah. as a company. Like if the VM is dying, then we got to find a place to put all these microservices. We need to shut that machine down and get something else going. That just happens automagically. Yeah. But then there's stuff that happens with our application, and we know about the health of our application, then we can tell Azure Service Fabric what to do. Exactly. It might be roll back, it might be retry, it might be, I don't know, what other things could you yeah, do? Yeah, restart the microservice. You know, it's gotten into a healthy state, but if I restart it, it might come back healthy. So mm -hmm. those kinds of repair operations mm -hmm. are all possible. Well, that's awesome. So now let's move on to the next question when it comes to Service Fabric. If you're a, a dev and you're thinking, I am considering using Azure Service Fabric, is there a specific type of application that would be, yeah, you should yeah. do that? Or sometimes, I remember my professor was saying, hey, there's an algorithm that will sort in faster than n log n, but it's like trying to shoot a fly with a shotgun, you know? Yeah. It's gotta be very large. When is using Azure, Azure Service Fabric shooting a fly with a shotgun yeah. versus we should really consider using That's it? That's a really timely question because one of the things I've seen, people that are watching the space of cloud native development, last year containers were that, that everybody was talking about containers. And then developers started to, to man, you know, figure out how we can de uh, package their applications and deploy them using containers. Right. One of the benefits of containers is it gives you this fine grain control and deployment mechanism. So naturally the next step is I'm going to take my application and decompose it into microservices. But then the, 
begs the question of uh, how do I orchestrate all these right. microservices through a full application lifecycle, something that understands that these containers over here are part of one microservice, these over here are part of another one. And the... Uh, it's a complicated thing, it, it right? Is, yeah, it's a complicated thing. And, uh, I guess, let, let me go back, I got lost in my train of thought. What was the question? The Kim? question was, when are you shooting a fly oh, with yeah, a shotgun? Yeah. yeah, so the complications come from the fact that you've decomposed your application, and now you've got to keep track of these microservices. The microservice platform can definitely help with that, but it, there is a layer of a complexity. The benefits you get are the 24 by 7 capability, the sure. immense scale, and the performance you get. But a lot of applications are simple. They might be a couple developers working on it. Sure. It might be something that I'm not going to upgrade very frequently. It's a line of business app that's going to perform this little job over here. And you know, I'm not going to want to spend a lot of time decomposing it into microservices and paying that overhead when right. it, the investment just isn't there, the, the payoff isn't there. And so you know, one of the, the kind of memes that have developed is break down the monolith. The monolith is bad. And this refers to having an application that is, has all the components right. in, entangled together and you're deploying it in one solid unit. The fact is it's more nuanced than that. Like you said, some applications, those ones that are, are small, that I'm not going to be upgrading very frequently, that don't need to get to massive scale, that I'm not betting my business on, I might want to just make that a monolith, you know, a website plus a, 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 a database. Data, yeah. You know, I'm not going to break the website down into little pieces when it's just a, a simple piece of code that's going to be performing some business logic on top of a website, a database. So, it is more nuanced, and I think people get, start to get carried away. Oh, developers think, oh, I need, if I'm not doing microservices for every application, then I'm just not with it. I'm, I'm not, not the yeah, hip guy. I'm right. not the hip, and I'm not doing the, the right thing. And you need to take a look at it on a case-by-case -case basis to decide the right tool for the right job. So it might be that it's, in your particular case, a, an Azure website is just perfect, and it's the bee's knees. But then if you're starting to get a lot of users, and it's starting to become more complex, and you're feeling like things are sort of falling apart at the seams, it might be a good time to start moving stuff over to service memory. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that um, it's best if you can think about the, the direction of the application, the evolution of your application. Think of the requirements as they're going to evolve ahead of time because mm -hmm. one of the challenges, and we've run into this ourselves in Azure where we started with a monolith and then we say, oh, you know, we really need to break this thing apart. Disentangling the pieces in it into microservices much harder than starting yeah. at the beginning and saying I need to make a, uh, a microservice based application. So if you can, make the decision up front, think about the life cycle, you know, the, the trajectory of the application, the importance of the application, the scale of the application, and make the call up front uh, that's going to take you in the right direction. What if, what if you already have an existing application, right? And you're trying, you're, you're noticing that you're having scale problems and you want to sort of rectify that by moving to Azure Service Fabric, and you already have something that's like an Azure website. Let's just say the Channel yeah. 9 website. We want to move it to, to, to use Azure uh, Service Fabric. Yeah. What would be a good strategy to start making that move? Yeah, great question. We've done this ourselves. Like I mentioned, we've taken some monolithic parts of Azure and broken it up into microservices. One of the first things we do is try to define this, the constituent components, those subsystems and then define strong contracts. And a lot of times when you have a monolith, they're all operating within the same process. Sure. It's DLLs or components within a DLL. So first step, break them into DLLs and have nice APIs where they talk to there's interfaces, other. you're not reaching into data structures without going through an interface. interface. Yeah. Once you have it broken into DLLs, then what the next step is to take those DLLs and break them out into their own services with a REST API instead of an in-process DLL sure. call. And so that's kind of the, the evolution. Uh, you know, step by step, breaking them apart, making them independent, and then making them truly microservices sure. is what we found works nicely. It's kind of an incremental approach to it. And, and, and the other question that I have for you is, because in your experience, you, you've, you've obviously done this, when is it the microservice become too micro, right? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? When does it become like, whoa, you shaved it down way too small, and now the overhead that you're paying for this is much more than the benefit that you're getting. How do you, how do you reach that sort of balance? Is there like a smell or something? Yeah, can... well, so if you read the kind of best practices on microservices, what you'll see is uh, microservice is really a, a two pizza team kind of size. You can rewrite the whole thing in two months. 
I mean, I think that that's a good rule of thumb to follow. Uh -huh. Again, we're, we're software developers are, there's a reason we're kind of artists, not just pure engineers. Because right. you gotta take a look at the situation and, and think about how, how hard it is to evolve this thing, how much investment do I wanna take in taking something and breaking it really apart when, again, just there's our monolith case, there might be subsystems that where you can see microservices inside of it, but it's really not gonna be a payoff to break them out. Really the, the microservices or the subsystems have correlated scale requirements and correlated life cycle, and so keep them together as one subsystem, even though they might be different functions. So it is really uh, a, you know, some art involved into this, and you're not always gonna get it right the first time, and that's okay. Yeah. You, know, you can always come back and refactor or meld things together uh, later. And, and that's really cool because I think the other question that I, that I had as a developer is when it comes to data, like it feels like if the microservices are sharing sort of data somehow, the, like the database or yeah. some other, it feels like that's cheating. Is, is that the wrong thing to do? And tell us why. Yeah, so for sure one of the principles of microservice application development is to have contracts in front of the data. The only way to talk to data is to talk through the microservice interfaces. You can think of, uh, you know, in the, the, the kind of process, single box process world, mm -hmm. if I can reach into another DLL's data structure without going through an API, that makes it impossible for me to rev that DLL without knowing whether I'm not going to break uh, the clients. That's a good analogy, yeah. So, uh, when you've got a strong contract though, you can test the contract. You can say, is it backward compatible? You can signal through versioning that there have been changes and so your clients can upgrade to new versions. Sure. Impossible to do if they're reaching beyond, through that yeah. and, and directly manipulating data structures in ways that you can't control. You know, once they have access to the raw data, they can manipulate it in however you want. So if there's a database schema, that effectively becomes a contract. You can't rev it. If you've got an API on top of that, you can hide the schema behind it. You can rev the schema, have the API change or stays the same, right. and that's a kind of uh, a layer of indirection between the client and the data. So without having that separation, you cannot get this agility of I every microservice being able to update independently of each other. Then that's when you start to get this coupling, you start to get this fragility. Awesome, so here's some questions coming in from Bart from Belgium. Can you give future insight on Docker container rollout technology planning for Windows in Azure? So one of the things that we've got already is you can go and deploy uh, ser Server ten, uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're up to TP4, I think, at this point in time. You can go and deploy that as a guest VM in either nano or full server or mm -hmm. server core uh, versions on top of Azure, and you can start taking advantage of Windows Server containers today. So that is possible off the bat today. Awesome. Now, uh, one of the things that, that one of the technologies that comes in Windows Server is Hyper-V containers. And Hyper-V containers require nested virtualization, the capability of Server 2016. So when we get uh, Server 2016 RTM'd and rolled out across the Azure infrastructure, we'll be able to light up nested Hyper-V containers as well for the hostile multi-tenant scenarios. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Now, we have about six and a half minutes left, so if you have, if you have questions, please have them come in. Here's another thing that was, was talked about today, and I wanted to get your take on it. Azure Functions. What is it, when is a good time to use it? Yeah, so Azure Functions, it's, uh, you can think of it as serverless computing, so you don't worry about the virtual machine, you worry about writing the piece of code, and the Azure Functions runtime worries about, hey, how do I get activate a virtual machine to place the function in and activate the function? You pay for only the resources used while your function's running, you don't pay for the virtual machine. If we start up the virtual machine and have it running for two hours for the execution of your function that's 10 seconds, you're only paying for the 10 seconds, uh -huh. so it's our job to go and have an efficient infrastructure right. underneath it. It liberates the developers because they are, now they're not worrying about capacity planning and extra charges for having these resources and having to make them extremely efficient, you know, the, the mm -hmm. pool of virtual machines. That's one aspect of it, the micro-billing serverless computing aspect. The other aspect is this trigger-based execution model. And there's lots of scenarios where you can think of where I want a piece of code to execute based on some action, whether it's uh, temperature on a sensor exceeding some limit, whether it's uh, somebody entering something into a chat window and right. a bot needing to go and respond to that. Lots of operations, event triggered, and lots of ways to get events or into the Azure Functions runtime through this trigger definition right. off of uh, service bus queue messages, event hub messages, 
objects dropping into Azure storage, timers, direct invoking, uh, directly invoking the HTTP yeah, endpoint, course. webhooks, uh, and, and we've got canned integration with things like GitHub. You know, so, you know, somebody drops something into GitHub, having some that uh, create a trigger. So there's that aspect of it too. Is this event sources integration with the trigger management, which plugs into the runtime, and uh, un also the the hosting environment, which is the app service hosting environment, where you mm -hmm. take advantage of app services integration with DevOps, you know, GitHub and Visual Studio Team Services, so you can publish your functions through that as packages that go through the full end-to-end -end integration, testing, you know, continuous integration, continuous de, uh, mm -hmm. delivery kind of uh, pipelines that we support. And that's interesting, right? Because it feels like Azure Functions are even more micro of, of the microservices. It's literally do this thing when this happens. Yeah. And you can have, I mean, how big are these functions? They're, actually, so there's, they're as big as you need them to be. So this is one of the things, we call them microcomputing, or you know, that's one of the names you give to them. But what you do in response to the trigger could be, I'm, in response to this trigger, I'm going to go drop something into this storage queue. You know, massage some data, drop something into the storage queue, or storage uh, blob, or storage queue, or table. But it could be something much more complex. It really is up to you to, for how complex you want that function to be. It could do, kick off a whole bunch of different workflows. It could do a whole bunch of complex processing on top of what it's got. You know, that trigger could signal, hey, there's been a, I'll give you a great example. Um, and near uh, from the Web Functions team, or Azure Functions team, showed this in his demo earlier today. Mm -hmm. uh, image gets dropped into an Azure storage account. That invokes a, a trigger that invokes a, executes the, the Azure function in response to that. That and ends up calling into our Katana intelligence functions to go do image recognition, optical character recognition on an image that then drops the result of that into a, an Azure table. And so if you think about the, what's happening behind the scenes with that uh, image optical character recognition, there's a lot of processing going on there. Right. Now, we happen to be calling a, a service to do that, but it could be done right in line inside sure. of that function. All right, so here's some questions coming in. I want to use the programming model of service fabric, but I'm not overly concerned with the uptime guarantees and the rolling updates. Is it possible to make the programming model with virtual actors available for a single server installation? so that I can get real life experience with the model in production without having to splurge. Yep, we've heard that a lot. People saying, I, I love the programming model, I want to take advantage of it, I want to use it both for single box deployments as well as you know, my highly available multi-box deployments. And so we are looking at ways to bring that power to uh, single box environments, and you know, smaller scale than five. So yeah. that's something we're looking at, yeah. It's also interesting that, that you mentioned, and I, I think we mentioned that in the video that we did together, is that you can actually run Service Fabric apps to test on your own box. That's right, yeah. And how, how is it doing that? So it's got basically simulated nodes. We call it Service Fabric Ring. The virtual machines or servers in them are called nodes. Mm -hmm. And when you're running on a, a single box system, Service Fabric's development environment is simulating for the Service Fabric runtime the existence of nodes. And so you were actually running, again, if you're testing with your your application against the five node scenario that you're going to have in production, you're testing with five nodes, simulated nodes on your dev box. Each one with the service fabric runtime instance, so it's exactly the same functionality, the same, they, they form their ring together the same way they would right. up in a real distributed system. That's cool, yeah. then I can have an excuse to tell my boss I need a bigger, bigger machine. That's right, you can. I need yeah. a bigger machine, yeah. boss. Yeah. Uh, Joel G says, how much does new security challenges play a role in Azure expansion and new features? How much does new, well I think security is something that is one of the foundational, fundamental concerns of Azure from infrastructure security to the security features of our API surface to security as a service in the form of Azure uh, Security Center, sure. for example. So it, it really pervades everything we do. Security, privacy, compliance, data protection, data sovereignty, all are fundamental principles of the Azure platform. And I think uh, we are industry leading when it comes to just how explicit we are about transparency of data and security of data. Make, you know, one of the things that I've seen that's kind of interesting is that about a year ago, we still heard the CIOs coming in, the CSOs coming in and saying, cloud, I'm not sure about the security of the cloud. We've really crossed in the last year, certainly in the last six months, a lot of them are now saying, okay, now I understand the cloud, I understand what you're doing better. Your environment's actually more secure than mine. We've right. heard that even from banks. 
that Azure's what? environment, the way we operate, the platform we give them, the insights we give them through services like Azure Container Service, or sorry, Azure Security Center, yeah. ASC versus ASCS, yeah. is actually makes them more confident uh, than what they have in their own infrastructure. Well, this is awesome. Obviously, I would love to spend more time with you, but we're out of time. Thanks so much. All right, went by fast. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. And again, if people want to learn more, they can always go to azure.com, and there's tons of good stuff there. Thanks for spending some time right. with us, Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Seth. Thanks so much for watching. Again, we're here at Build 2016. We'll see you just after a tiny break. Stay tuned.